Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to a wrap-up of most of the stuff that I've read so far in October. I have missed a couple of my weekly wrap-ups, so I have catch-up to do today. This is going to be a long video, I'm just gonna accept that up front. So, without any further preamble, let's get into it. The first thing I have to talk about today is Runaways Volume 1, Find Your Way Home, which is written by Rainbow Rowell, and I believe it was illustrated by Chris Anka. Now, I read the Runaways series by Brian K. Vaughn back in the early 2000s, and that was back at a time when I didn't know anything about the Marvel Universe. I don't think I actually realized that Runaways was part of the broader Marvel Universe at the time. But now I do know that. And I always enjoyed that series, and I was randomly looking through the new books at one of my libraries and noticed that there's this one, and I thought, that's written by Rainbow Rowell. I wonder what that is. It turns out this is like a direct continuation on of Runaways from Brian K. Vaughn's run on the series, or however this stuff works in the comics world. So um, I'm hooked. <laughs> Um, so if you've never heard of The Runaways, uh, the basic premise, as far as I remember it, and I'm like thinking back 10 years here, um, it's about a group of teenagers who discover that their parents are like evil supervillains in the Marvel Universe, and they band together, deciding they're not going to be like their parents, and they form this group called The Runaways, and it's a lot of fun. Unfortunately, the beginning of Runaways Volume 1, Find Your Way Home, is a complete spoiler for the end of the series written by Vaughn. So I'm not going to go into details of what's going on, but it's kind of a reintroduction of the characters, catching you up on what's happened in about two years within the universe, and will these teenagers get back together and kind of bringing the band back, <laughs> or whatever, um, and then setting it up for the storylines to come. And I loved it. I just was taken straight back to what I loved about the characters and the way it's written and everything. So I will definitely be continuing on with this one. I believe the second volume is coming out in a couple of days, and I went straight to my library and put a purchase request in for it, so hopefully I will get it pretty soon. Then I read Exit Strategy by Martha Wells, which is the fourth and final Murderbot novella. Because it is the end, I won't talk about exactly what happens in it, but it kind of comes full circle from the beginning, and it was a nice end to the storyline in these novellas. I'm very glad that there is a novel coming as well, probably in 2020, because I still feel like there is more, more to explore with Murderbot as a character and what it will do, especially in the situation it ends up in in Exit Strategy. So I really, really love this one as much as the first two. For some reason, the third one was a little bit of a dip for me, but number four Exit Strategy was it was so good. I am such a murder bot fan. After that, I finished The Woman Who Thought She Was a Planet and Other Stories by Vandana Singh. This is Singh's first short story collection, and I enjoyed it. I want to recommend it to everybody, but it is out of print, like multiple times out of print because it's been published more than once. And it's really hard to get a copy of. I've been trying to track down this book for months. I tried to buy it multiple times. I had all my orders canceled because apparently it wasn't actually an inventory. I tried to interlibrary loan it twice. The first time they sent me a completely wrong book and then they finally sent me the right thing. Whew, it was good. It was worth all that effort. <laughs> there are multiple things I really enjoy about Singh's work. I mean, I think she's just a very solid writer in general. She has very interesting stories and ideas, but she's also Indian. She was born in India, and all of her stories basically feature Indian characters, and if the stories are set on Earth, they're usually set in India. And I love that. I love seeing the culture and People behave differently, their everyday lives are different, but also familiar. And it just takes these stories to another level to me because they're not, how should I say, white bread Western science fiction stories? <laughs> that might be a bit harsh. Um, but yeah, I just, I love that influence. I'm getting mail delivered on a Sunday. Oh god, I really hope the mailman can't see in the window and see me filming myself. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> Another thing that I really love about these stories is the way she incorporates like 
a lot of mathematics and more theoretical physics. Some of the stories even feel like they verge into magical realism or the supernatural or um, fantasy tales or, or mythical fantasy tales, but I would actually in the end classify the whole thing as science fiction. But there's something she does with using some of these more abstract concepts and like unpacking them in the story, letting you see how it affects a character's life, especially over the years and everything, that really reminds me of Ted Chang's work and the way that he uses his central abstract ideas in a lot of his stories. So this is the big thing I came away from this collection thinking is it just struck me how much I think people who enjoy Ted Chang's work would also really like Vandana Singh's. Let's see what I got delivered on a Sunday. I think I know what this is because it's from Amazon. Aha! I got a microphone. For all you people who have been like, Rachel, you can get a microphone to help with the sound issues. I know, I bought one. I'll play with this a little bit later. Is it ironic that I got it in the middle of filming a video while there's a dog barking outside? Um, we'll return to that later. <laughs> Next up is Green Glass House by Kate Milford. This is a middle grade novel. I guess I would classify it as mystery. There's also kind of a twist ending that makes me classify it as something else, but I'm not going to say what it is because I don't want to ruin the twist for anybody. It completely took me by surprise. So basically this is about a young boy named Milo who lives with his parents in Green Glass House, this fantastic huge house with a large number of stained glass windows that give it its name. The house has been converted into an inn and Milo and his parents run it. They've just entered into the winter holiday season. It's kind of the off season when there aren't any guests at the inn. And just as they're settling in for the Christmas holiday, a bunch of random strangers converge on the inn. And it seems like all of them have a particular interest in the house and finding out something about it and its history. And Milo teams up with a young girl who comes to the house to see what is up with all of the guests staying there. There's like kind of a hunt for treasure. There are maps. There are explorations in the attics, finding old items that have been put up there for storage. And it's all taking place after a huge snowstorm where everybody is snowed in. Just all the things. I love the setting of this. I love the elements of it. It's exactly the kind of book that I loved reading when I was a kid as well. So, oh, I don't know what else to say. I really enjoyed the characters and the plot. Um, one of the things kind of in, in the background of the whole story is that Milo is adopted and he is struggling with that identity of loving his parents but wanting to know more about his biological family and feeling like wanting to know about his biological parents means he is in some way like betraying the parents he does have who he loves. And that struggle of identity and where do you belong and families and everything, I really like that as well. I thought it was very well woven into the story where it, it's an important part of it, but the story itself isn't entirely about, oh, adopted kid. There are a lot of other things in there as well. So there is a sequel to this, which I will definitely be checking out soon. I hope it is just as good. Then I read the second volume of the Courtney Cromeran series by Ted Nafee, which is called Courtney Cromeran and the Coven of Mystics. At the moment, I am slightly blanking on everything that happens in this comic, but I really enjoyed it. I remember just being in the middle of reading it and thinking, this is good. I really like this story. I really like this character. Courtney is so disagreeable and um, antagonistic towards other characters, especially children her own age. and. There's something about the way that she is, the way that she's written, that it works. Like, I don't find her irritating. I find her amusing and interesting and complicated rather than a turnoff. So um, in this one, I think this is the one where Courtney kind of goes up against the Coven of Mystics, which is like the Witches and Warlocks Council sort of thing, and is trying to uncover who is actually responsible for releasing this horrible monster in the community. The Council is pointing at a creature who is probably blameless and Courtney actually wants to help that creature. Um, it, it was a good story with a good point and kind of the, the mob mentality of going after the, the easiest person to blame who actually is blameless 
that kind of resonated with me and the what's happening in the world right now. So enjoyed it thoroughly. Can't wait to get more of these. I have to get them through interlibrary loan, so it's a bit slow, but it's worth it. Then I finished Primary Inversion by Catherine Asaro, and unfortunately I didn't like it very much. I really want to like this series. This is the first book in the Scolian Empire series, and I read the sixth book a couple years ago because it was a Hugo and Nebula award winner, and it worked pretty well as just a standalone. So I wanted to come back eventually and try to read the series in proper order. And I don't think I'm actually going to do that anymore. Um, when I finished reading this, I was really fired up. I had a couple of rants ready to go. Now that I've sat on it for a couple of weeks, I'm not so sure I want to really dive into that. What I think it boils down to is I didn't think this was very well written. I think on the language level, this was not written that well. It was a bit hokey. Some of the descriptions were just why did you say it that way? And I came away feeling like the entire story and kind of the author was obsessed with just aesthetics. It's a story about beautiful people and a lot of them having sex with each other. And it, not only are the people beautiful, the worlds are beautiful. And if it's not beautiful, then it's not worth talking about. It felt so shallow in some regards. There were some things about it that I did like but they kept being offset by really disturbing things. This is um, romance science fiction. This is a romance story in a science fiction world, and I think it fails as a romance because of the sexual dynamics, the sexual politics, and some of the really disturbing sexual violence in the story, and I was not happy with some of the sexual content. Like, it's supposed to be romantic, except I'm not rooting for the protagonist. I thought she was irritating and annoying and so on. And I found, like, all of the men that she ends up with were just so two-dimensional, including her soulmate, who seems like a major character, is such, like, a limp dish rag. He's beautiful and tortured, and they've got a telepathic bond. And I'm starting to rant now. Um, yeah. So, primary inversion, I read it, I'm done with it. If there's anything that Asaro has written outside of this series, I would like to know because I would like to read something else by her that's not like this, if that is even in existence. Next, I read 1491, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus by Charles C. Mann. I actually listened to the second revised edition of this on audiobook, and the physical copy I own is the first edition. I'm going to be keeping it in my collection, though, because this was a fantastic book. I'm so glad I finally read it. And it's one of those books that I loved it and appreciated it to an extent that I actually find it difficult to really articulate why, but I think it's just that this was revolutionary material that just kind of blasted apart my conception of what the Americas were like before Europeans arrived. And I think it's because a lot of this directly contradicts what we are taught in school about what the Americas were like before white people showed up. And it has made me think about history and the what-ifs so much more in a very exciting but also sad way, because what this book is basically about is there were many wonderful civilizations in the Americas, there were many more people living in the Americas before Europeans showed up, and they were all killed. It was genocide, multiple times over, from disease and violence and slavery, and like, what could the world have been like if that hadn't happened? the world could be so different. So much, so many people, so many ideas, so many talents, you know, have been lost. And the fact is, it was probably always going to happen. There are actual reasons, including like genetic reasons, why this happened and why the, you know, native people of the Americas were so susceptible to European diseases and such. It was unavoidable in many ways. And yeah, it just, it's affected me. I also think this book is just well-written, well-researched, 
well-reasoned. I, I do think that the author kind of goes off into his own theories by the end of it, but I kind of agree with him. I feel like he's making a really good point with all of this. So this was a great book. And if you are curious at all about um, what life may have actually been like in the Americas pre-Columbus, this is a really good one to pick up. Yeah, I wish that I had gotten to this book a lot sooner. Next, I finished a novella by Adrian Tchaikovsky called The Expert Systems Brother. In short, this is about a young man who is accidentally severed from his community on a very strange planet with an environment that's pretty deadly to people if they are not integrated properly. Um, this young man is initially partially severed. He tries to survive in his community with the help of his sister, but because he is severed, he's basically shunned and he can't consume a lot of the food because it becomes poisonous to him. He just, he can't survive there. Then his sister is taken over by an expert system, which turns her into the community's medical expert, which means she suddenly has the knowledge and abilities and like a, a technological ghost overriding her body. And she is going to completely sever him from his community because he is unwanted, unneeded, and a possible threat. He runs away, meets other severed people, and learns some surprising truths about the world that he lives in. So a lot of this is from a perspective of a young person who cannot really recognize that things are scientific and technological and logical and, and man-made. He's living in this world from within it where it's really difficult to see that and to really understand what's going on. He does come to a bit more of an understanding and seeing that happen is really interesting. This kind of scratches my itch of kind of like a, almost like a fantasy world where people don't realize they're actually living in a science fictional world and the reader sees that and figures it out with the characters. Except this is not originally fantasy in any way. Um, so I really liked the premise, just that idea of, of basically colonists who have learned how to survive on a very harsh planet where everything's trying to kill them by like chemically changing themselves and the repercussions of that and losing their knowledge, losing their technology. Really interesting. But the eventual end of the story and kind of this introduction of a, a zealot character and his crazy, zany, almost religious stuff kind of killed the mood for me. I don't really like characters like that. I don't really care about the introduction of that element. I was there for the discovery of the world and how it actually works. So really great beginning, so-so ending. I wish that it had felt more satisfying it was a good story though. Then another book that I really enjoyed, this is The Cloud Roads by Martha Wells. Yes, I am finally digging into her back catalog now that I have to wait for the next murder bot story. So uh, The Cloud Roads is the first book in her Raxura series, which is fantasy, as far as I can tell so far. It has such interesting world building though. So the world itself, as the characters move around the world, they constantly encounter the ruins of countless other civilizations and other species. And I think that is so cool. Just the idea of layers of civilization and these constant starts and stops to cities and countries and, and all of this and characters who kind of have to take it for granted that they're living in the, the ruins and the leftovers of previous civilizations. And like, was the world always like this? I, I feel like there's so much history in this world. It makes the landscape that the characters move through really intriguing. But the story itself, this begins with the character of Moon, who I think is the protagonist of the entire series. He is, he doesn't know what he is. He is a shapeshifter who's uh, shifted dragon-like flying form looks an awful lot alike the fell, which are a really nasty, violent, sadistic race of beasties and shapeshifters that are kind of the major threat in this entire world. So Moon doesn't know what he is. He was orphaned at an incredibly young age. He was never told uh, or never able to understand who he really is, where he came from, what species he is, etc. He's just lived on his own his entire life and figured out 
how to survive and how to fly and hunt and all these sorts of things. But he is disturbed because he is always mistaken for Fell in his shifted form. Um, and then he finally meets somebody who is like himself and he discovers that he is Raksura. There's so much more going on here, but I love this character. He is, he's one of those sort of reticent people. He can be very grumpy and not very tactful sometimes, but he seems to have, he, he means well. He seems like he's actually very kind at heart and he is just battling through his scars and his sense of where does he belong and is he going to stay or is he going to run away? Can he make a home for himself amongst people who are like him, but he doesn't have anything in common with really? He doesn't fit into their society and their rules and their behavior and everything. So, oh, it was so good. I am in the middle of the second book, the sequel to this, and it's just a direct continuation of the story and I'm enjoying it so much. What I will say, um, if you enjoy fantasy, definitely check this out. If you are a fan of Martha Wells because of her Murderbot stories, um, definitely check this out as well because I feel like there's a real similarity just in the characters and the writing style, the matter-of-factness in this world, which is very much something I, I associate with Murderbot. Um, so thoroughly enjoying this. I hope to read the entire series pretty quickly. I think that was an incoherent gush, but hopefully you get the depth of my feelings from that. Next up is Howard's End by E.M. Forster. This is a complicated story to explain because it's very abstract in concept, I think. I, I'm pretty sure this is about the shifting social classes in England prior to the World Wars and just the sort of upheaval happening in society, the friction between the like rich capitalistic very traditional English families and then your growing more bohemian artistic and socially progressive families like the Schlegel sisters who are at the heart of the story and then the poorer people who are represented by the Bass, a couple that the Schlegels attempt to help with some disastrous consequences. So basically the Schlegel sisters, Margaret and Helen, meet the rich Wilcox family by happenstance when they are traveling in Germany. The elder Schlegel sister, Margaret, befriends Mrs. Wilcox, the matriarch of that family, for a very short period of time. They have some sort of intense friendship, which is very odd because they're very different people. And then Mrs. Wilcox dies very suddenly, and she thinks that Margaret is some sort of kindred spirit, and she leaves Margaret her house, Howard's End, which she feels very strongly about. Only Margaret never knows about this because the Wilcoxes decide that uh, Mrs. Wilcox's last will or her, her note about this is just, you know, it's no one's gonna take it seriously. And then Mr. Wilcox, after the death of his first wife, falls in love with Margaret, they get married, things ensue. And there's a lot of friction there because Margaret and Helen, the, the whole Schlegel family, are definitely more socially progressive. They're intellectuals. They think very much about things. They, they think about making friends and making connections in a way that the Wilcoxes just don't. And basically, Margaret is trying to change Henry Wilcox's personality, about how he thinks about people. That they're, the Wilcoxes are good people, but they are unthinking, they are kind of uncaring, they don't really see other people as human beings. There's this lack of depth of feeling in them and they're kind of repressed emotionally is how I would say it. Um, so Margaret wants to be happy and she wants to change her husband to be more like her, I think. It was a very interesting story in the issues that it brings up, and I think the social commentary in this particular time in history in, in English society, in, in Europe as well, right before the World Wars. I really thought that peek into that time period was fascinating. However, in the second half of the book, I just really hated the Wilcoxes. <laughs> oh my god, I just... Um, especially Charles, the one of the sons, but also Henry Wilcox himself. Um, and I just, I think 
there's something horribly morally wrong with the Wilcoxes, but also that probably tells you something because I'm coming at this with a very modern, more Schlegel-like um, outlook on wor the world and human behavior and how people should you know, see and interact and treat each other. So yeah, I am like fundamentally against the Wilcoxes. But I also just thought this whole idea of Margaret marrying a man in order to change him, to fix him or whatever was, that just seems like such a misguided thing. Like don't be in a relationship with somebody because you think you can fix them. We usually say that's a bad idea. <laughs> I'm really glad I read this. I wish that I had loved parts of it more, but it was still a good story. The penultimate book I have to talk about is Akata Warrior by Nnedi Okorafor. This is the sequel to Akata Witch, which I read a couple of years ago and really enjoyed, but I think that I liked Akata Warrior even more. This was pretty much a five-star book for me, so I rated it at that. So this series is about Sunny, who is a Nigerian-American girl who's living in Nigeria. She is albino and she discovers that she has magical talents. She is what is called a leopard person. In the first book, she discovers this. She is inducted into leopard society and she begins her schooling and training as a leopard person. Akata Warrior takes place a little more than a year later. She is adjusted more to her new life, this new routine. She has to keep most of her life secret from her family who are lambs. They are from the mundane world and don't know about leopard society. In Akata Warrior, Sunny um, comes back to this vision she saw when she first knew she was a leopard person. She saw a vision of the end of the world in a candle flame. And this is kind of her journey, her quest with her friends to figure out what her vision actually means and where she needs to go and what she needs to do to stop this. And it comes back to the villain from the first book, Ekwensu, who I think is kind of an evil, scary masquerade that uh, Sunny will eventually have to face again. And I really, I really liked the characters. I really felt like I understood Sunny more as, as a person here. She's really developing and, and becoming this great person. Um, but I also think that the, her group of friends is more fleshed out and the, the dynamics between the characters were even better in this book. Another thing that I want to mention that I really liked is that there's more of Sunny's family in this, particularly her brothers. Her older brother, Chukwu, is actually a major part in the story, and I really liked that. I liked that they were part of the story, kind of verging on knowing more about what Sunny is, even though they're not actually allowed to know. Um, and there's that balancing act that Sunny has to have between preserving the secrets of leopard society, following the rules of her world, while also wanting to protect her family. And can you do both without breaking the rules? Um, so all the things that I really, really enjoyed here, I definitely like this one more than the first book and the first book was also very good. So I hope that there is another book eventually. I would love to read more about the adventures of Sunny. There's definitely more to tell, but I also liked that this book felt quite neatly wrapped up by the end. Um, it's not screaming for a sequel. There isn't a cliffhanger. It is pretty self-contained and I really like that. So maybe eventually a Korofor will have another story to tell here and I will be ready for it. And the final thing that I have to talk about is The Wondrous Workings of Planet Earth, Understanding Our World and Its Ecosystems, which is written and illustrated by Rachel Ignatowski. This is a really delightful book. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was surprised at how much I learned from this. When I went into this, I thought, I already know a lot about how the world works and the environment and ecosystems and stuff, but actually this was a wonderful refresher on things that I haven't read about since I was in elementary school. So it is kind of organized into um, how terrestrial ecosystems work, then aquatic ecosystems, and then some of the basic cycles of the environment like um, the water cycle, the phosphorus and nitrogen cycles and things like that. And there are wonderful illustrations um, for all of these things. And that just makes this so great. I was reading this and thinking, I would have enjoyed elementary school science so much more if textbooks looked like this. I would have been so into it. Um, I liked science when I was a kid. I was good at it, but this would have made it so fun. Um, so yeah, this is a great introduction to the topic of the environment and ecosystems, how they work, um, and also 
um, sections on climate change and um, what, what people can do to be activists and to help preserve the environment. I loved it. It was just delightful and educational. I would highly recommend it. I need more. <laughs> but the only bad thing is that it's short. I could have used a lot more. And that is it. Those are all the things that I've read so far in October. I am caught up on talking about them now. Let me know if you have read any of these or if you want to, leave me your thoughts in the comments down below. And thank you very much for watching what I suspect will be a very long video. <laughs> so I will talk to you again soon and until then, bye.